1905, the Russian Empire occupied one-sixth of the earth. It was ruled by the Emperor Tsar Nicholas II through an authoritarian and police monarchy. The population was mostly peasant and their lives were suffocated by the Tsar's taxes and the oppression of the landowners. It was the last country to abolish servitude in 1861, but the peasants were still bound to the land and in extreme backwardness due to the lack of urbanization and the opportunities in the cities. The situation was no better in the cities. The working class was small in number, extremely exploited. It was concentrated in factories established by foreign capital, mainly French and English. The Russian bourgeoisie was very weak. Russia's development was a result of the exploitation of peasants and workers by merchants and other sectors with constant increases in taxes destined mainly for the budget of the armed forces. In 1904 Russia begins a war against Japan over Manchuria. The foreign debt increased spectacularly as did the oppression of the population. This situation combined with a workers assent for economic demands led to a period of effervescence in the country. Strikes took place in several factories but the unions authorized by the government and financed by the police attempted to corrupt the proletariat. However the workers struggle became more organized. One of the union leaders was a priest, a former prison chaplain called George Gapon a suspected police agent. On Sunday, January the 9th, 1905, Father Gapon led an enormous, passive, orderly demonstration of 150,000 people carrying portraits of the Tsar Nicholas II and Orthodox saints, which met in the square in front of the Winter Palace, the Tsar's residence in St. Petersburg. The march was proposed by the Liberals, to push the Tsar and the workers supported it. The Social Democrats convinced the workers to present a great number of demands amnesty, civil freedom, eight-hour working day, wage increase, progressive transfer of the land to the peasants and mainly summoning a constituent assembly elected by universal suffrage. They also demanded the immediate end of the war against Japan. This petition reflected the consciousness of a working class that had just arrived from the countryside. They still believed the Tsar was their protector, godfather, and began by saying, Sire, we workers, our children, our wives, our old, helpless parents have come, Sire, to seek truth and protection from you. And they ended by warning, These, Sire, are our greatest needs which we bring before you. If you do not grant them, if you fail to hear our plea, we shall die here, in this square, in front of the palace. And they died. Some publications mention 150 to 300 deaths. Lenin quotes journalists who spoke of 4,800 deaths. The reason for the uncertainty, according to Trotsky, is that the police moved and buried the bodies in unknown places. Most likely there were over a thousand deaths. The Cossack troops shot on armed workers for the whole day. When news of the massacre spread, a wave of strikes shook the country. The demand for a constituent assembly grew. In September, Russia was defeated in war. This triggers a new wave of strikes, which in October involved 500,000 factory workers and 750,000 railway workers. 43 of the main cities struck between October the 10th and 17th. The main slogans were the eight-hour working day, amnesty, withdrawal of troops from the streets and constituent assembly. The autocracy decided it was better to lose a saddle than a horse. On October the 17th, a constitutional manifesto was published, granting the election of the Duma by a broad electoral constituency with a legislative character and democratic freedoms. It was the first victory of the movement. Some days before October the 13th, a new organism emerges, made up of factory shop stewards and workers' parties' representatives. 
thus was born the first Soviet of workers' deputies in Petersburg. This first Soviet lasted 50 days. In little time, its authority became unquestionable. It was in charge of all the aspects of the upheaval, from food distribution to printing journals and arms distribution. The last composition of the Soviet had 562 delegates, representing nearly 250,000 workers. Its executive committee had 31 members, 22 worker delegates and 9 party representatives. Trotsky was one of its presidents. The Soviet answers the constitutional manifesto with a proclamation by Trotsky. We have been given a constitution. We have been given freedom of assembly, but our assemblies are encircled by troops. We have been given freedom of speech, but censorship remains inviolate. We have been given freedom of study, but the universities are occupied by troops. We have been given personal immunity, but the prisons are filled to overflowing with prisoners. We have been given a constitution, but the autocracy remains. Everything has been given, and nothing has been given. There was a setback that lasted until the end of the month, and then a new and powerful surge in November began with military uprisings, mainly sailors, whose symbol was the rebellion of the battleship Potemkin and the peasant insurrections. The peasants burnt down over 2,000 landlords' manors and shared between them the supplies the nobility had stolen from the people. In the city, the battle cry was for the eight-hour working day and arms, while among the oppressed people, a movement for national liberation explodes. Martial law is abolished, but the counter-revolutionary acts continue. Against the eight-hour working day, the capitalists answer with a lockout, and the government feeds the pogroms mainly taking a revenge from the Jews. Over 4,000 Jews were murdered and 10,000 were mutilated. The liberal bourgeoisie and intellectuals, who had initially supported the workers' movement, its economic demands and the struggle for the Constituent Assembly, retreated with the enactment of the Constitutional Manifesto and mainly due to the fear of workers' advances hitting their interests. The spirit of upheaval dominated the barracks and from December the 2nd, uprisings began in the Moscow barracks. On December the 3rd, the executive committee of the Petersburg Soviet decided to prepare a political general strike. This time, the autocracy had no further hesitations. They sent their troops to the buildings where the Soviet office was installed and arrested all the members, including Trotsky, its president. The center of the revolution is transferred to Moscow. The strike in Moscow began on December the 7th with 100,000 workers on strike. On the second day, 150,000 struck. It was a common place seeing soldiers and officers speaking in demos. On December the 4th, a Soviet of soldiers was formed in the heart of the army. The strike paralyzed the cities and factories of the Moscow region. The first violent confrontations with the army took place. Worker guerrillas entered the action. They attacked government troops, then disappeared among the population. This urban guerrilla tactic demoralizes the soldiers that struggle against an invisible enemy. Despite this heroism, the situation is not sustained. And on December the 18th, the Moscow Soviet put an end to the strike. The revolution ended with a great defeat and the Tsarist revenge was felt for months afterwards. According to approximate figures, from January the 9th, 1905 to March the 23rd, 1906, over 14,000 people were assassinated, over 1,000 executed, with over 20,000 wounded and 70,000 people imprisoned or exiled. The defeat was the result of the immaturity of the masses and the lack of a revolutionary party inserted in the working class that could lead the revolution to victory. In 1917, history was different.